Race and Slavery in Adam Smith, possibly episode one of Racism in Economics. So uh, there are two parts to the presentation. First, Smith's use of the word race. And second, uh, Smith's discussion of New World slavery and colonialism. So starting with his use of the word race, he talks about the human race, the race of laborers, the race of scholars, race uh, as a word for aristocratic house, the colonial inhabitants of Brazil, he calls a race, and the pre-colonial inhabitants of the Cape of Good Hope. So now I'll go through the textual evidence for each of these. So first, human race, it, that is, the propensity to truck, barter, and exchange, is common to all men and to be found in no other race of animals, which seem to know neither this nor any other species of contracts. The race of laborers, a man must always live by his work, and his wages must at least be sufficient to maintain him. They must even upon most occasions be somewhat more, otherwise it would be impossible for him to bring up a family, and the race of such workmen could not last beyond the first generation. And now a second quote for the race of laborers. The wages of the laborer, it has already been shown, are never so high as when the demand for labor is continually rising, or when the quantity employed is every year increasing considerably. When this real wealth of the society becomes stationary, his wages are soon reduced to what is barely enough to enable him to bring up a family or to continue the race of laborers. Uh, now, the race of scholars. That unprosperous race of men commonly called men of letters are pretty much in the situation which lawyers and physicians probably would be in upon the foregoing supposition. In every part of Europe, the greater part of them have been educated for the church, but have been hindered by different reasons from entering into holy orders. They have generally, therefore, been educated at the public expense, and their numbers are everywhere so great as commonly to reduce the price of their labor to a very paltry recompense. So now uh, there will be three examples of race as an aristocratic house. So first, the French kings of the Merovingian race all had treasures. When they divided their kingdom among their different children, they divided their treasure too. The next example, when Robert, the second prince of the Capetian race, was most unjustly excommunicated by the court of Rome, his own servants, it is said, threw the victuals which came from his table to the dogs and refused to taste anything themselves which had been polluted by the contact of a person in his situation. This third example, I think, is uh, particularly interesting because it shows that Smith doesn't limit his use of race to refer to uh, aristocratic houses that are in Europe. The distinction of birth not only may, but always does take place among nations of shepherds. Such nations are always strangers to every sort of luxury, and great wealth can scarce ever be dissipated among them by improvident profusion. There are no nations, accordingly, who abound more in families revered and honored on account of their descent from a long race of great and illustrious ancestors, because there are no nations among whom wealth is likely to continue longer in the same families. Okay, so now uh, I move to his discussion of uh, the inhabitants of Brazil during the colonial period. Uh, and this is uh, both of these cases uh, where race comes up in the discussion of, of colonialism. Uh, he's talking about the Dutch. But the Dutch government soon began to oppress the Portuguese colonists, who, instead of amusing themselves with complaints, took arms against their new masters, and by their own valor and resolution, with the connivance indeed, but without any avowed assistance from the mother country, drove them out of Brazil. The Dutch, therefore, finding it impossible to keep any part of the country to themselves, were contented that it should be entirely restored to the crown of Portugal. In this colony, there are said to be more than 6,000 people, either Portuguese or descended from Portuguese, Creoles, mulattoes, and a mixed race between Portuguese and Brazilians. So the, his use of race here, um, let's say, is, is more consistent with uh, how it would be used now. Uh, but I don't think one needs to understand it as having any kind of biological uh, overtones. It's perfectly consistent with a 
uh, historical cultural, a purely historical cultural interpretation. So now turning to the Dutch in Africa, the Dutch settlements at the Cape of Good Hope and at Batavia are at present the most considerable colonies which the Europeans have established either in Africa or in the East Indies. And both these settlements are peculiarly fortunate in their situation. The Cape of Good Hope was inhabited by a race of people almost as barbarous and quite as incapable of defending themselves as the natives of America. Now, an intermediate conclusion, uh, Smith uses race to mean group, class, or type. Uh, some of his uses have the flavor of descent group, but others, for instance, when talking about men of letters, uh, do not at all. Even this last example, discussing uh, the indigenous people of uh, the Cape of Good Hope, um, it would be very easy for us to read as uh, potentially being racist, uh, but it's clear that the function of it in his um, in his uh, discussion is simply to point out that it was easy militarily for um, for the Spanish to conquer the New World and for the Dutch to to colonize uh, the Cape of Good Hope. So that's a comment, you know, purely about. Uh, the comparative uh, level of, of uh, military technology uh, in in the two peoples. And I don't think uh, in his text has any sense of, of any other sort of cultural or certainly not uh, biological superiority. Okay, so now turning to part two, Smith on New World Slavery and Colonialism. I'll again give a quick overview and then uh, go into the textual uh, evidence. So on slavery... Smith makes a number of points, a number of observations. First, that liberal government is worse for the condition of slaves than autocratic government is. Second, that wage labor is cheaper than slave labor. Third, he claims that production conditions determine the percentage of uh, slaves in a population. Now, on colonialism, uh, I I won't I will give the evidence uh, later, uh, but uh, the quick version is that uh, Smith opposes colonialism. He thinks that colonialism is not uh, good for the metropole, actually, uh, let alone for the colonies. Okay, so first, liberal government uh, is worse for the condition of slaves. Now, this is a relatively long quote, uh, but I think it's, it's interesting, so it's worth doing. That the condition of a slave is better under arbitrary than under a free government is, I believe, supported by the history of all ages and nations. In the Roman history, the first time we read of the magistrate interposing to protect the slave from the violence of his master is under the emperors. When Vedius Polio, in the presence of Augustus, ordered one of his slaves, who had committed a slight fault, to be cut into pieces and thrown into his fish pond in order to feed his fishes, the emperor commanded him with indignation to emancipate immediately not only that slave, but all the others that belonged to him. Under the Republic, no magistrate could have had authority enough to protect the slave, much less to punish the master. Uh, and now the next quote. In all European colonies, the culture of the sugar cane is carried on by Negro slaves. The constitution of those who have been born in the temperate climate of Europe could not, it is supposed, support the labor of digging the ground under the burning sun of the West Indies. And the culture of the sugar cane, as it is managed at present, is all hand labor, though, in the opinion of many, the drill plow might be introduced into it with great advantage. But as the profit and success of the cultivation which is carried on by means of cattle depend very much upon the good management of those cattle, so the profit and success of that which is carried on by slaves must depend equally upon the good management of those slaves. And in the good management of their slaves, the French planters, I think it is generally allowed, are superior to the English. The law, so far as it gives some weak protection to the slave against the violence of his master, is likely to be better executed in a colony where the government is in a great measure arbitrary than in one where it is altogether free. In every country where the unfortunate law of slavery is established, the magistrate, when he protects the slave, intermeddles in some measure in the management of the private property of the master. And in a free country, where the master is perhaps either a member of the colony assembly or an elector of such a member, he dare not do this but with the greatest caution and circumspection. The respect that he is obliged to pay to the master 
renders it more difficult for him to protect the slave. But in a country where the government is to a great measure arbitrary, where it is usual for the magistrate to intermeddle even in the management of the private property of individuals, and to send them perhaps a lettre de cachet if they do not manage it according to his liking, it is much easier for him to give some protection to the slave, and common humanity naturally disposes him to do so. The protection of the magistrate renders the slave less contemptible in the eyes of his master, who is thereby induced to consider him with more regard and to treat him with more gentleness. Gentle usage renders the slave not only more faithful, but more intelligent, and therefore, upon a double account, more useful. So it's just worth noting from these passages that Adam Smith uh, does not support the legal institution of slavery uh, and thinks that uh, natural humanity would lead someone to uh, want to intercede between uh, a master and his slave if the master is is behaving violently. And then he also thinks that um, giving people uh, the dignity of 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 uh, sound mind and body and some self respect uh, makes them more economically productive. Not views that would have been popular in the antebellum South. Moving on to the next point: wage labor is cheaper than slave labor. The wear and tear of a slave, it has been said, is at the expense of his master, but that of a free servant is at his own expense. The wear and tear of the latter, however, is in reality as much at the expense of his master as that of the former. The wages paid to journeymen and servants of every kind must be such as may enable them, one with another, to continue the race of journeymen and servants, according as the increasing, diminishing, or stationary demand of the society may happen to require. But though the wear and tear of a free servant be equally at the expense of his master, it generally costs him much less than that of a slave. The fund destined for replacing or repairing, if I may say so, the wear and tear of the slave is commonly managed by a negligent master or careless overseer. That destined for performing the same office with regard to the free man is managed by the free man himself. The disorders which generally prevail in the economy of the rich naturally introduce themselves into the management of the former. The strict frugality and parsimonious attention of the poor as naturally establish themselves in that of the latter. Under such different management, the same purpose must require very different degrees of expense to execute it. It appears, accordingly, from the experience of all ages and nations, I believe, that the work done by free men comes cheaper in the end than that performed by slaves. It is found to do so even at Boston, New York, and Philadelphia, where the wages of common labor are so very high. Okay, now the next point, that productive conditions determine the percentage of slaves uh, in a population. So he says, The pride of man makes him love to domineer, and nothing mortifies him so much as to be obliged to condescend to persuade his inferiors. Whenever the law allows it, and the nature of the work can afford it, therefore, he will generally prefer the service of slaves to that of freemen. The planting of sugar and tobacco can afford the expense of slave cultivation. The raising of corn, it seems, in the present times cannot. In the English colonies of which the principal produce is corn, the far greater part of the work is done by freemen. The late resolution of the Quakers in Pennsylvania to set at liberty all their Negro slaves may satisfy us that their number cannot be very great. Had they made any considerable part of their property, such a resolution could never have been agreed to. In our sugar colonies, on the contrary, the whole work is done by slaves, and in our tobacco colonies, a very great part of it. The profits of a sugar plantation in any of our West Indian colonies are generally much greater than those of any other cultivation that is known either in Europe or America, and the profits of a tobacco plantation, though inferior to those of sugar, are superior to those of corn, as has already been observed. Both can afford the expense of slave cultivation, but sugar can afford it still better than tobacco. The number of Negroes, accordingly, is much greater in proportion to that of whites in our sugar than in our tobacco colonies. So it seems that Smith is saying that, that people are inclined to turn to the most uh, unfree, most tyrannical uh, forms of labor organization uh, and maintain them as long as possible. And it's only when they become uh, economically unviable uh, 
uh, that uh, that instead uh, more humane, more just uh, arrangements are are made. Okay, now uh, turning to then Smith's uh, explicit views on colonialism, I want to argue that he is an anti-colonialist. I think it's a pretty open and shut case. Here's what he says. He says, folly and injustice seem to have been the principles which presided over and directed the first project of establishing those colonies, the folly of hunting after gold and silver mines, and the injustice of coveting the possession of a country whose harmless natives, far from having ever injured the people of Europe, had received the first adventures with every mark of kindness and hospitality. Now, uh, next quote. Such have been the general outlines of the policy of the different European nations with regard to their colonies. The policy of Europe, therefore, has very little to boast of, either in the original establishment or, so far as concerns their internal government, in the subsequent prosperity of the colonies of America. So the conclusions are that Smith opposes slavery and colonialism, stressing primarily uh, economic rationale, but he clearly morally objects to both as well. He acknowledges that differences of cultures can correlate with or cause different economic outcomes, uh, especially when it comes to military technology. He seems to have no notion of cultural or biological inferiority or superiority. So he's uh, he's really quite egalitarian and certainly not a racist. <laughs>